Hey everyone, welcome to another session of class. I hope everything's going well for you and uh, that you're having a, a good semester so far. Um, I appreciate you uh, working with me to, to meet with me and to drop by my office so that we can, on a weekly basis, be able to connect and, and touch basis on where things are at. Um, in terms of the course and, and uh, any updates that that you have or any questions and we're able to resolve those so I appreciate your help with that um, and today we're gonna be moving forward so this topic georeferencing and digitizing you'll you'll see that it's listed in both the 1820 and the 2900 class um, it's very useful and needed in, in both classes we will have a homework assignment in 1820 practicing what we accomplished today and this should help with uh, our projects in our in our course for um, 2900 so with that being said let's start to talk about georeferencing and digitizing and what those terms actually mean um, so georeferencing well what is georeferencing here's Here's a definition that you might come across if you were to look it up. Aligning geographic data to a known coordinate system so it can be viewed, queried, and analyzed with other geographic data. Georeferencing may involve shifting, rotating, scaling, skewing, and in some cases warping, rubber sheeting, or ortho-rectifying the data. Oh wow, well there's a lot to that definition for sure. Um, Georeference is, here's kind of a, a, another simpler um, abbreviated uh, definition, which would be to combine some type of information or data with its proper location. Now, in terms of an image, there's a lot that goes into that as we consider all the different points that we want to have correct, um, but it can apply to a lot of different types of data. Okay, so, uh, and and something to think about. Now, how do we accomplish this with ArcMap? I, I thought I'd outline just a couple steps on the screen for you. We will do it together in just a few minutes. So, um, first thing we need to do, add the georeferencing toolbar. It looks something like this, okay, and, and we will do that together in just a moment. Ensure that you're working with an image file and that the file is in a connected folder. Now, georeferencing does not work with PDF files, which is unfortunate because a lot of the data that you and I will work with in our class and also in the in the job workforce is involves PDFs that we often need to bring in and georeference. So sometimes we'll need to convert those to a different file type. Okay, so it's not a .pdf, but maybe an image file type like a .jpeg, G-P-E-G, J-P-E-G. Um, and there's other types of files that work as well, like TIFFs, .tif, and, and others. And we'll look into that again uh, later on as we continue our discussion. So we drag the image into the map. Um, and then we, from the georeferencing toolbar, you ensure that the image you want is listed as the layer. Find the area that's close to it and click Fit to Display add control points from the georeferencing toolbar and finally rectify to create a new file or update to change the current file. Okay, and, and you'll see these steps later on but hopefully you see kind of a, a process that you can consistently follow as you go to review this again follow these eight steps and, and hopefully that'll fill in uh, the what to do will fill in as you consider this list of guides. Okay, so um, something I thought would be worth discussing uh, to convert a file for, that's a .pdf to a .image file, some sort, like a JPEG, um, we might need to convert something. Here's a, a free web page um, that you're able to, that we can look at and, and use. So I'm going to click on it and go to that page just so that we can see what's there. Now I will tell you, anytime you 
come into a page like this, oftentimes the ads like this one will be click here to download or click here to something. The ads are placed in such a way that you have to be careful not to select, you know, some sort of malware. Um, but here's kind of what you'll do. Uh, you, you can choose a PDF file and when I click that it brings up the file explorer on my screen. I can select a PDF file, create convert, I can choose a quality. Um, excellent gives more uh, more pixels okay, to the screen and, and creates things a little bit better. And then we click convert and it'll convert to a JPEG file that we would then be able to bring in to ArcMap. Okay, so, so we can use this. Um, also know that if you ever download anything that's in a .zip file that you'll need to extract it. Now what's that mean? If we look inside of just a file explorer, I'm going to come to my downloads and I often have several zipped up file folders in here. For example, these are, are examples of that. It's a file that's a compressed folder. Now I can double click on it and open it up and see all the files inside, but I won't be able to work with these files unless I unzip them or like this says up here, extract them. Now the way I do that is I like to come, I right click on the zip file. You can kind of see a zipper across that folder for the icon and I can choose extract all and when I do that I then choose a location I can browse to another folder to have all of those files extracted or decompressed or, or pulled out of the zipped up bag if you can think of it that way just by clicking uh, extract. Now you don't have to do it within the folder you're working with because you can choose another folder to have it extract to. Okay so that's that's another thing that I think is useful for us to cover in this class and things that you'll be doing a lot. You'll be extracting information from zip files and also uh, compressing information into a zip file. Now zip files are easy to upload to things like Canvas. They're easy to send to people. You can email a zipped file but you can't email a folder. Okay so they have uh, some purpose there that's pretty handy. If I wanted to create a zip folder like for example I could put all of these documents and send to a compressed or zipped folder okay, and I could name it and I'll just say example and now this file could now be shared and, and sent and someone else would be able to decompress it and work with it so and I could uncompress it by right clicking and doing extract all choosing a location just like we saw before, okay? Um, so be aware of those tools and, and please use them, okay? Please uh, practice zipping up files and extracting them. Make sure you understand what it's doing um, because that's a skill that you'll often use in the, in the workforce and in, in your job. Okay, so um, knowing that we have those skills, we are going to jump over to Canvas and we are going to look at georeferencing together. Okay, so again, just as a reminder, our different steps. We need the toolbar. We need to make sure we have an image file. Uh, we'll bring it into the map from the folder we're connected to. Um, we'll make sure it's listed as the layer in georeferencing. We'll find an area uh, where it's close to where the image belongs. We'll do fit to display and then add control points. And finally, rectify to create a new file or update to change current file. Okay, so with those steps, um, I'm going to pull out of this presentation quickly and come into ArcMap. Now inside of ArcMap, uh, this is a brand new opened up document. We're ready to go. A couple things I want to remind you of. Uh, as, as we come to start a new project, we want to set up our file structure for this project accordingly, which I've already done. And, and let me just show you where it's at here as you kind of watch my um, file explore. If I come into Documents, and I'm going to jump into our class inside of Presentations, and I know I've got a whole lots of folder, whole myriad of folders. Inside of this, you can see uh, several things. So for one, I have our three folders. Oh, and, and this needs to be put inside the Geo Database folder. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to right-click on it and cut it. 
and geo database folder is inside of my GIS data folder. I'm going to come in and paste that item. So please, as you start any project, please have these three folders and inside of GIS data have geodatabase, raster, shapefiles, workspace. Um, and just as a reminder, all of the data we collect will go into here. Our .mxd files or map files will go in here and any exported or produced PDFs will go into that folder. That way everything is organized um, in such a way that it's easy to work with. It's easy to take these three folders and to place them onto a flash drive. So please work that way uh, with those that arrangement of, of data structure. Okay, so I've got these folders all ready to go. Um, inside of GIS data, inside of raster, I have a couple PDFs, okay? And I already created them into images once, but I'm going to do it again for all of us, just so that we can um, remember how that was done. Okay, so with that being said, everything's set up. I'm going to first get my blank map. Okay, I'm going to choose my blank map template. Uh, where's my default geo database? Well, we're always going to set that up as well as we start each project. So coming into uh, I'd better connect this to a folder. Connecting to inside of documents. I'm going to find this folder, examples and presentations, and I'm going to connect to it. Okay, so within here, I'm going to come into our week two georeferencing folder, and um, inside of GIS data, I have this geodatabase. I want the default not to be the railroads geodatabase, but a new geodatabase, and I'm I'm going to call this geo reference. Okay, and and now geo reference will be our default geodatabase. I'll add that. You can see the file path listed there. And I'm going to say okay, and then a couple other things I like to always make sure I do as I start a project map document properties. I'm going to make sure relative path names is stored. Um, I'm going to fill out my map document properties with a title, summary, and the author at least. So this is practice for georeferencing. We are learning to georeference in ArcMap and author I was going to put my initials, I'll put my name, Kyle Rowley. And I will say apply and OK. OK, now that is given to our map. The last thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to set us up a coordinate system that we're working from. So from layers, I'm going to come in and, and select properties. And the coordinate system I'd like us to work from today is NAD83 UTM Zone 12N. Now, I have established several favorites that I often go to. If you have not established favorite coordinate systems, uh, I would encourage you to do so. So a couple of them you might want to consider. Coming into projected, I would definitely add our state plane. Um, NAD, now, we could do NAD 83 with the 2011 collect, correction of U.S. feet okay, and do Utah Central. I'm going to right click and add to favorites. Okay, another one that I would make sure that you have is UTM, NAD83, and Zone 12N. Now I already have this one added to favorites. Um, that's why it's not an option for me. But we are going to have it add to favorites today. So with that being said, I will select UTM. NAT83 UTM Zone 12N as our coordinate system. I'm going to say apply and say OK. And now that should be set uh, within our map. So um, 
let's put our map on hold for a minute and let's jump back online. We're going to convert our file to be from a PDF to a JPEG. So I'm going to come in, choose PDF file, and finding our folder here, presentations, examples and presentations, georeferencing, GIS data, raster data. Here I have the Salt Lake PDF. Now, both of these PDFs are, are listed on Canvas under an assignment called uh, Georeferencing and Digitizing Practice. Okay, and that's that assignment you will have and will need to complete over the coming week. Um, and so both PDFs are listed there. You're, you're, you will be able to download them there and also download them to work with me on this example. Now, with that selected, I'm going to say Open. So it uploads that. Uh, the quality, I want it to be excellent. And I'm going to convert PDF to JPEG. And it will start to work on that and will produce a document. Okay, so here it is. I can download it. It's called Page One, my JPEG pictures. Um, I could download it as a zip. I'm just going to download it offline, and now that's a JPEG, okay, with a, a JPEG name. I'm going to say show in folder. Let's see where it put it. It's in the downloads folder. I'm going to rename and we'll just say Salt Lake Valley Historical. Okay, that's that's our that's our image. I'm going to right click on that and cut it and take it to the folder we were working from, which is available to me in this quick axis. I'm going to paste it into this folder. And there's the image. So uh, similar to what you see right over here. Okay. Okay. So now that we have the PDF as a JPEG, okay, that was one of our steps. Um, let's come back into the map. And we've set up our coordinate system. We've set up our metadata. We have uh, done relative path names. Um, we should be good to go. Now, I like that we set up our coordinate system first because now as I apply a base map, that base map will fit the coordinate system that we chose. Okay, so just remember, like we said earlier, anytime we bring in data, the first piece of data that's brought onto the map, unless a coordinate system has been predefined in the layers, the map will adopt that coordinate system. So if you don't want the map to adopt the, the default coordinate system of a base map or the imagery, then you need to declare it beforehand if this is the first thing that you add, which for us, in this case, it is. So let's see, what should we choose to help us bring these images in? Um, you know, for right now, I think I might choose our topographic maps. I think that might be a good option. Do you want terrain would probably be a good option. Let's try terrain for this. So I'm going to add this. You'll see a kind of a world view of our base map in just a moment as it has kind of been warped to the projection that we selected. And we'll let this work on it for just a few minutes. And it starts to bring it in. Okay, so it follows the NAD83 uh, UTM Zone 12 and projection, which is not skewed for Utah. And for everything above and below Utah, it actually does really well. For everything to the right and left, we are way off. Okay, as you can see, South America is extremely exaggerated. Um, but for Utah, it works really well. So let's come into Utah. Now, the imagery that we're going to be working from couple things I know about it and um, one of those things that I know let's go ahead and look at it Salt Lake Valley historical I know that this image has uh, it has Utah Lake okay it has part of the Salt Lake downtown um, part of the Great Salt Lake 
maybe Willard Bay area. So all of that is documented here as, as best as can be expected from a map that I believe was produced in the 1800s. Here we have 1885. So again, um, just to remind you from what we've discussed, we're going to take this image that doesn't have any location tied to the file. Okay, all of this is is an image file, and we're going to give it a location. That's, that's georeferencing. So we want this image to be pasted onto our map right here near Salt Lake City and in Utah. So then we have kind of this up-to-date terrain model, and then we have a pasted-in historical map of the Salt Lake area, okay? So that's kind of what we're up against um, as we do this. How do we get this into here? Now, again, following our steps that we took, I'm going to kind of zoom in, and I'm just going to get close to where we want to be. And we'll say this is this is quite close. Okay, this this is close enough. Okay, so with us um, here looking at the Utah Valley or Utah Lake, kind of in the center of the screen, uh, let's look just here in our catalog at what we've got going. So I'm going to click on the catalog. Let's look at where our folders are connected to. And boy, you know, I'm I'm connected to a lot. I'm going to deconnect to a couple of these just to clean up my screen a little bit. There we go. Okay, so connected here to um, Geology 1820. We are working in Week 2 georeferencing. And inside of GIS data and raster, we have a couple image files. Now, notice our PDFs do not appear in this folder. Only our .g .jpg or JPEG files do, one of them being Salt Lake Valley Historical. Now, if I drag this over onto the, onto the screen, you can see it's working on things. Um, it's going to say the following data sources you added are missing spatial reference information. This data can be drawn in ArcMac but cannot be projected. And I say, okay. And it's somewhere, okay? It's listed in my layers. It's somewhere, but it's not where it should be, right? And I can right click and say zoom to layer. And it takes me somewhere. And here's our map. Okay, so where are we? Um, looks like blue water all around our map as if we're in the ocean somewhere which is right okay because it wasn't assigned a location ArcMap chooses to place it at coordinates 0 0 for whatever projection this is now for a UTM zone 12 projection that's going to be somewhere on the equator and um, somewhere far to the west of where we're interested in Okay, so we're out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere, and let's just zoom out a little bit farther and work our way back to Utah. Which, boy, we really need to zoom out to be able to do that. All right. Let's continue to zoom out here. Now we're at 1 to 40 million. Okay, so hey, this seems about right, okay? This is right near Ecuador, which is right along the equator, and we're a little bit east of Utah. So it's placed it at coordinates 0, 0, wherever that might be. Um, but let's go back to Utah. And I'm going to come in, zoom in here. And we will prepare to bring that image up out of the Pacific Ocean and onto our map. Now I've zoomed in just a little bit. We'll let the computer update the imagery.
And in the meantime, I'm going to come up to the gray space up here and make sure that I can toggle on the georeferencing toolbar. Now you can see I've got a couple toolbars up here already. I've got 3D Analyst and Tint Editing. Um, but I'm going to make sure that we get this georeferencing toolbar to appear. Now, with us zoomed in this far, um, and with our image in the layers, and the georeference toolbar appearing, a couple things we can do and need to do. First off, I need to make sure that my image is showing inside of this drop down box. Now, if I had multiple images in my layers, I would have multiple images in this drop down box. But I've only got one, and so it appears by default, which is good. Now, let's look inside of this georeferencing drop down menu. Now, here's the update and the rectify, those are the last of our eight steps. Uh, but next, what we need to do is we want to bring that image up into what we're seeing on the screen. Now, it's kind of funny um, what we're seeing on the screen. I, I really want us to, to see things a little bit better, and I might choose a different base map in just a moment if, if this one doesn't have the resolution that we would like at a closer uh, viewing point. And it's just too white okay, for, for my liking. So I'm actually going to right-click over here and remove our base map and add a different base map. I just want us to be able to see this a little bit better. And this might take just a moment or two, so I'm going to pause it while I do that, and I will choose a, a different base map to use. Okay, so I've brought in a topographic base map, so thanks for your patience there during the pause. Um, which I can see things just a little bit better and, and I'm more comfortable with that. So uh, with that being said, again, we want to bring our image up into view. So step number one is to bring that image out of the Pacific Ocean, wherever it's at, up into the view on our screen here. The way we're going to do that is with this selected, it knows what image to bring. And dropping into the georeference toolbar, when I say fit to display, it's going to bring that image and put it on to whatever I'm looking at. Now, for right now, that's Utah Lake, West Jordan, uh, Mill Creek, Salt Lake City. If I'm anywhere, wherever I'm viewing, it'll bring that image. So let's try it. Let's click Fit to Display, and hey, it brings it and it fits it to our screen. So if we were anywhere else, it would it would do that as well. Now I can toggle it on and off and see kind of where it's at. And you know, it's not bad. It's scaled down still. It's it's smaller than it needs to be. But it's close, okay? And at least it's in Utah now. So fit to display gets it here. Um, the next thing we need to do is to add control points. Now to do that on this toolbar, it's your first little button here, this add control points. And you do two clicks. The first click is always onto the image, and then the next click is onto the map. So let me demonstrate this. Um, the first thing to do is, as you prepare to do that, is study on your image and on your map places that you can see And sometimes you need to help the, the display update. But I want to try to find places that will be easy for me to reference. Okay, um, for example, I might look at Fort Douglas. I might look at uh, maybe this spring here, this Hot Springs Lake somewhere that I can see on both images, um, maybe a mountain peak. Okay, as I kind of look at the topo. So I'm just going to kind of look around for a minute, study my map carefully, sometimes even toggle it off, come up into Salt Lake. Farmington Bay. Um, and I'm just going to find places that I'm somewhat confident on 
their location. Now I'll tell you this will be easier when you do the assignment and do the Stampede Valley and the reason is is because um, the city blocks are not that different from what they were in the 1880s. Um, there's a similar number of city blocks where here you'll see I mean Sandy had five blocks and Draperville okay which we now call Draper has eight um, so kind of interesting things I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for some mountain peaks that I can work from so Clayton Peak uh, is is one up above Midway and, and Snake Creek Canyon uh, so let's see if we can find Clayton Peak on this map so here's Alpine South Jordan coming across into the mountain. Here's Midway. Let's see if we can find Clayton Peak. And, and I would say right there is Clayton Peak. Okay, so that'll be a good reference point for us. Um, and, and we might use some other mountain peaks to help us fit this image where the city schematic is not going to, to serve us very well on this historic map. Okay, so with that being said, I'm going to toggle our image back on and I'm going to add control points. So I click add control points and remember click on the picture first and then back on the map. So I'm going to zoom in to Clayton Peak. I wonder who Mr. Clayton was. So zooming in onto Clayton Peak right above Alta. My imagery is, is slow to update. I'm going to put a control point right on the middle. And it, t it tags it with a little one. And then the next thing I do is I come and I turn my image off. Now that one represents a place on the picture, not on the map. So now without clicking, I'm going to come and find Clayton Peak on the map. So coming over here, Snake Creek Canyon and Clayton Peak, the Snake Creek Tunnel almost runs directly to Clayton Peak. And this is a little bit more of an exact location. We see the peak at 10,000 feet. And I'll, I'll tell you, if you have not been up Snake Creek Canyon, it is a visit you will never regret. It's so pretty. I'm going to come and, and focus in on that point, And I'm going to click. And now you'll see a red one. And now, as we look at that, if I toggle the image back on, you'll see it's placing Clayton Peak right at the same location. Okay, we've got one point set. Now it has only moved the map, it's shifted it. Um, so now we need to find another place to get another point from. from. Now as you georeference, you'll need at least three points to properly georeference. And if you have your points in a line from each other, so for example if we chose Clayton Peak and then another point b below it and another point below that, they would those three points would kind of form a line. We don't want that. We want the three points to form somewhat of a triangle. Okay, so uh, and as close to an equilateral triangle as is possible. So it would be really good for us if with Clayton Peak selected, if we chose, now it's kind of in the middle of things, we chose something up here. Uh, and over here, or maybe we could do 
some sort of point down down here in Utah County. Maybe I'll choose Heber Mountain and then maybe Provo Peak. And that will give us somewhat of a triangle. Okay, so I'm going to try to to find Heber Mountain. Provo Peak, I don't think we'll have trouble finding. Let's see if we can find Heber Mountain. And find the summit of Heber Mountain on here. This is Daniels Canyon. I've been along that road several times. Let's just look at our image again to be able to see it closer. Okay, so Heber Mountain is up and above Daniels Canyon. And there it is right here. And we will let this be our second point, and then we will go find Provo Peak. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so turning that back on. I'm going to zoom back out. And let's come onto our map and find Heber Mountain one more time. So here it is. Kind of a little knoll there. Must be a pretty place. And I just dropped a point. So that should be labeled as point two. Okay, and you can see it there in green. Now I toggle off the image and I zoom to where Heber Mountain is on the map. And it's right down here. Oh man, that looks like a really pretty place. Okay, and the imagery is a little bit slow, but we'll see if we can't get it to come up. Okay. Hey, and there's a road to the top of Heber Mountain. Now, I didn't get too exact on my last view, so I won't be too exact here. Okay, so that's our second point. Let's zoom out and find Provo Peak. I'm going to toggle the image back on. Now, what did that do? Well, it shifted, it rotated, and scaled for point number two. So point number one, it shifted it, meaning it moved the image left or right. Point number two, it rotated and or scaled the image. Okay, so now I'm going to come in and right here above Provo, I see Provo Peak. Very pretty place. I'm going to center my crosshairs on the image. I 
and then I'll drop a point. Okay, so there's Provo Peak. Now, it will be able to stretch the image perfectly between three points. It always does, um, but there's going to be some trouble when it tries to do it between four points. Okay, and, and we'll see that in just a minute. Now, how far off are we from Provo Peak? Well, let's see. There is... Let me orient myself a little bit. Okay, Hobble Creek. Uh, oh, wow. We're actually very close to Provo Peak. So it doesn't, it won't need to skew the image too much more as we drop our point. So now, um, backing off of this, with our point selected, we can turn our image back on. And it should match quite closely. Okay, so you can kind of, if you watch Provo or Pleasant Grove, see where, or uh, American Fort Canyon, Provo Canyon, you can see where they were and where they're meant to be. I'll tell you another pretty place to visit if you follow up American Fort Canyon where this railroad used to run. Um, it's a, there was a little mining community up there and really pretty place. It's remote though. It's a little bit remote. Okay, so you know I, I like how this turned out. Um, as I'm looking around, I like where Payson's at. Uh, Salem looks pretty good. I think it did a good job. Now let's just say that I accidentally add a point that I don't want. So maybe a point on the image here. That's point number four. Now adding four points is a fine thing to do. There's nothing wrong with it. But once you do, you will notice there's going to be this little blue line discrepancy. It's shifting the map. It's trying to hold as close to each of those four points as possible, but it can't do four points perfectly. It never will because you're causing it to stretch in ways that it doesn't, isn't able to. So it'll try to get close, but it's going to show you with that blue line the discrepancy between the points you've chosen as you do so. Now, I did that by accident. I, I really liked where it was at. I'd rather keep the three points. So what I can do is I can come over here and I can view the link table. Okay, and on the link table, those are my control points. This fourth value, I want to delete it. So I can come here and delete the link. And now I'm back to the original three. There's no discrepancy. Everything seems to be in order and I can close out of that. So know that you can do that. You can also add control points and manually put in information. Now if we had gone with a GPS unit, um, that would be something that we could do if, if we knew the location on this image in terms of its pixel location and maybe plug in GPS information about that. So that's something to think about. Now, once I have that kind of where I have it, I want it set, I don't want to accidentally click any more control points. Um, so I'm going to come into georeferencing and what I'm going to do is I can do rectify or update. Now update will save this image with a location. So it'll this image will now not just be your run of the mill JPEG, it'll be a JPEG with a location assigned to it. If you choose rectify, and I'm going to click on rectify, it'll actually write out a new file, okay, a, a brand new file um, that will uh, have a location associated with it, and then the original image file won't be necessarily the same file, okay, so 
excuse me, that's that's one option. You can choose an output location. You can give it a name, uh, format, um, compression type. So that's an option. Okay, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I wanted to show it to you. I'm just going to do update. And clicking update doesn't require any any more than just that. Okay, so there's no menu necessarily associated with it. And I'm going to toggle off um, that I'm doing control points and just grab my mouse arrow. Okay, so now we have um, an image that has a location and, and I feel like it did a pretty good job. Now what we've been asked to do is to digitize a few of these railroads that maybe don't currently exist. So let's talk about what digitizing is. I'm going to jump back to our presentation for a moment. And let's look at a definition for digitizing. So similar to what we said earlier, uh, here's a definition for digitizing. And again, this comes from Esri. The process of converting the geographic features on an analog map into digital format using a digitizing tablet or digitizer which is connected to a computer. Features on a paper map are traced with a digitizer puck or device similar to a mouse and the XY coordinates of these features are automatically recorded and stored as spatial data. So let's just say here's kind of below that my simplified uh, definition creating a digital record of spatial features and may then be referenced with GIS software. So uh, a creating a digital record of spatial features. So um, it's going to be taking the that railroad and making it into something. Now steps to digitizing. Here's six steps. So the editor toolbar, make sure it's there. Uh, the create features box should appear. If not, click on the button on the far right. This is the create features box along the editor toolbar. Select the feature that you want to edit from the create features panel, which should be over to the right hand side. Now the editor toolbar should look something like this. Okay. Once that has happened, because you've selected it from the create features menu, you can choose this button, which will um, allow you to begin drawing onto the map. Uh, after you're finished doing so, you can save your edits and stop editing. Now, um, that's, you know, kind of helpful for us to have a list of, of things we need to do, but let's actually get in and, and practice it together. So I'm going to jump back out of here and come back into here. And let's start to create a record together. Now, it might be interesting for us to bring on current railroads. And inside of our geo database folder, we've actually got railroads. So let's just see where they're at. See where they're still at. See if any of the lines match up. And hopefully they should. Uh, let's, man, let's make it something bright and bold so that we can tell where these are at. Oh, well, look at that. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Uh, some of the lines still match quite closely the historical lines, um, and some of the lines are, are not there anymore. I think we're seeing some discrepancy in, in how some of these were drawn. Uh, boy, you know, I think some of, some of this lines up quite nicely. As you look at how it comes into Provo, I, I think it comes into Provo just like that. Um, I think they altered a few of these lines and, and their path from the past. But it's definitely interesting to look at. However, some locations are still very similar to what they were before. Coming into pace, and here's this loop that the trains always make right next to the freeway. Okay. So, kind of interesting. Um, 
let's go ahead. I'm going to say let's digitize just what I spoke of earlier, this railway that went up American Fort Canyon. Clearly not a rail anymore. But let's digitize it at least as far as, as where we can see it used to be. So following that process that we just showed on the slide, let me do that for you here on the computer. So first I'm going to jump into our catalog. And what we're going to be creating is a shape file. And this shape file is going to be a, one that we'll want to hang on to. So I'm not going to create it in the workspace, but in the shape file folder itself. And I'm going to come here and right click on this and come down and select new. And from new, I'm going to say a new shape file. So let's give this shape file a name. I'm going to call this American underscore fork underscore canyon underscore rail. Okay, so the American Fork Canyon rail. Um, we're going to be creating our own shape file. Uh, there's three different types we can, well, a couple different types we can create. Three main types, point, polyline, and polygon. Here's multi-point and multi-patch. Don't worry about those. We we'll just want to do polyline today. Uh, make sure you don't leave it on point. We, we do need it to be on polyline. And then I'm going to come in and edit our coordinate system. Now our map is given in UTM NAT 83 zone 12. I want to create this data in that same coordinate system. And so I'm going to, going to say OK. And with the coordinate system selected, the feature type correct, and a name provided, I will say OK. Now you'll notice over here inside of the catalog, that file now appears. It's a shape file. Is there anything in it? Well, no, not really. It also appears over here in our layers. Is there anything showing? Well, no, not really. That's because we'll need this editor toolbar. Now, if you don't see it up here somewhere, uh, you'll need to toggle it on. And again, right-clicking in the gray space, you can come in and find editor. Now, with this appearing in layers, I'm going to right-click on it come down to edit features and say start editing. Hopefully once I do that and the computer thinks about it a box will appear over here that's a, a create features box. Okay, and, and we'll see if it does or not. It looks to me like the box did not appear. And so since it didn't appear, I'm going to come up and click the Create Features box. So this opens just like you can read the Create Features window so you can add new features. So I click on it, and once it's here, I can click on American Fort Canyon, and that tells it what one it wants to be edited. I don't know why it didn't know that before, but you can select any that you've created. So I'll select that one, and once I do that, these buttons here in the middle become an option. And one of them is this straight line segment. Um, another one that's really useful is trace. Okay, So if you have other features, we could trace along those features. Um, and maybe I'll show that to you in just a moment. But this first one here is straight line segment. So with that selected, I'm going to come and I'm going to start digitizing this which means just dropping clicks onto the map. So again, we are, we are clicking onto a historic map to create a digital, uh, a digital data sample of, of what we have here. So I'm just going to start clicking. And depending on the resolution of the image that we have, how well we were able to georeference it, will partly determine the level of digitizing that you choose to do. How closely you zoom in and because our, our accuracy and precision is all relative. I mean, you have to remember even the things we measure directly with maybe a GPS unit have some error associated in the measurement. We're just hoping 
to make the error extremely small. Now to end the line you'll double click. I'm going to come in as far as this line used to go through downtown American Fork and double click. Once I do that, this is now a line. It's not saved um, until I come into this editor toolbar, click save my edits, and then I come in and stop editing. Now once I do that, this now exists. I can toggle it on and off. It has a file. Um, it's created inside of the shapefile folder that we made and so it's there. Now I stopped editing as well. I can right click on it again and start editing just like before. Select it from the create features map. I can uh, oops I just created a segment I didn't want right here so I'm going to delete that while it's highlighted. If I want to delete this I can click it with this black selection and click the delete button off my keyboard. I can also double click it and that allows me now to edit it again. Okay, so I could move the location of that point up to there. Okay, so a couple different options for us um, to edit the vertices. Uh, so different things that you might want to consider. Um, if I click on finish sketch, it's like double clicking. Okay, now one thing I want to point out to you, uh, if you come in, I'm sorry, my, my mind has skipped a beat. Well, I'll show you in just a moment. I actually did, am thinking of something with polygons. Okay, so this can now be a line that's created uh, and is selectable. Again, I'm going to stop, stop editing. And yes, I, I will save my edits. Okay, so now you can create uh, some of these shapes and polylines which I, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you to do so and to practice. Um, before we close, I want to show you, it, it's very easy. I'm just going to create another shape file quickly, and I'm just going to call this one polygon underscore practice and make it a polygon in type. Give it a coordinate system. Say OK. Let's start editing. Now, for the assignment, you're not asked to do polygons, but I just want to show them to you. So now with that being said, I'm, I'm in the editor. I could click American Fork, and I actually would go into Line Editing. I click on Polygon Practice, and I go into Polygon Editing. So let's go ahead and, and just outline Alpine here. I want you to notice that it is creating a polygon as we do so. and I double click to close off the shape. Now, um, as you do that, right click on this, uh, you know, after that, and you want to edit it more, maybe you accidentally clicked a right click. We can click Edit Vertices and we can move these around. But now also if we right click again and finish sketch, oh, excuse me. Finish 
finished part. No. Um. Give me just a moment. I'll I'm going to put it on pause. I and then I will remind myself how to do something and I'll come right back. All right. So, I think um the feature I'm thinking about is available in ArcMap 10.5, not in ArcMap 10.3, which is what I'm using on my current machine. So I'll hold off on that and, and talk to you about it another time. But we've been successful today digitizing different things uh, as well as georeferencing an image. So um, I would like to ask you to please do the same project uh, with the map included in Canvas. Um, for your homework assignment. Please let me know what questions you have as you digitize and as you create shape files. Uh, please don't forget as you complete them to save edits and again to stop editing. Now they are there, they are created with a specific type of um, coordinate system attached to them. And that's available if you're ever curious, feel free to open up Art Catalog and I'm going to do that coming into ArcGIS open up Art Catalog and let's just look at what happened when we created uh, this railway and we'll finish up class with that short discussion so inside of Art Catalog again the same connected folders are, are that are connected in ArcMap are connected here jumping into week two georeferencing and coming in and finding our data here's the American Fort Canyon rail dot shape um, here's a preview of what the line looks like okay and the description which you can expect will not contain much information at this time um, but is something that we could add information to. Okay, and I'm having a hard time here with with my old computer. And here we go. Here here comes the description. Okay, so there's no summary. Um, we could edit this information and start to add some of the metadata or data about the data to this, um, which would be a good and useful thing to do. I'm going to close this out and we'll call it a day. Uh, we will see digitizing and georeferencing throughout the length of the semester. So I'd encourage you to continue to practice it, to um, be aware of it, and to learn of it. Learn everything that we can about what we're working with. Um, thank you for tuning in today. I, I hope things are going well and please stay in touch as you come across needs that you may have or questions that may arise. And I'll talk with you soon. Thank you.